So we're in this series on Romans, and we're looking at Romans 5, 6, 7, and 8. And I mean, this is a powerful section of Scripture. Maybe you could argue one of the most powerful, maybe number one most powerful passage in the New Testament because it, it just contains so much, not only about forgiveness, but about our new identity, about walking by God's Spirit and trusting Him in the moment, what the Christian life looks like, what the Christian life doesn't look like. And last week we were in Romans chapter 7 and we got about halfway through. And so to begin today, I want us to look at uh, six truths that we saw last week kind of in review, six truths, and then we're also going to ask three questions as we launch in to the second part of Romans 7. This is going to sound familiar to you. If you were here last week, these things will really help shape where we're going. Uh, truth number one, the law has jurisdiction over someone only while they're living. Now that just makes common sense, right? I mean, you're not going to get a ticket if the police officer arrives at your door and you're dead. Uh, the law doesn't have jurisdiction over a dead person. Well, it's the same with the Jewish law, and that's what Paul is saying. He's saying we died to the law. So the law doesn't have jurisdiction over us as Christians. We've died to the law, and we were joined to another not a dead teacher from 2,000 years ago, not a dead religious leader, but we are joined to the risen Christ. And so because of that union, then we see there's a new way to serve. And remember, there's a new way to bear fruit. So this is our goal. Maybe you remember from last week, our goal is not to be radical, to be radical, our goal is not to be outlandish. Our goal is not to be rebellious. Our goal is, Lord Jesus Christ, I want to bear fruit and I want to serve in the newness of your spirit. How do I do it? And his response is, step one, you die to the law. You die to the law so that you can serve in the new way. You die to the law so that you can bear fruit. There's no other way to bear fruit. So if we think we can bear fruit under the law, that's not fruit. The works of the law is not the fruit of the Spirit. Those are two different things. And so he's got some incredible truths that he shared with us as we start asking some questions today. First, we see truth number four here. The law gives sin an opportunity. A lot of Christians do not realize that. Under the law, sinful passions are aroused. People say grace is so good, but we need to balance it with law. Do you remember what that means? Grace is so good, we need to balance that with law. What they're saying is victory is so good, we need to balance that with failure. Victory in Christ is so good, and yet we need a little bit of loss to make sure they fail. People don't realize they're saying that. They don't know what they're saying when they seek a balance of law and grace. But Romans 7 tells us multiple times that if you put somebody under the law, sin actually increases. It doesn't decrease. If you put somebody under the law, then sin is aroused in their lives. It's not diminished. And so these things are counterintuitive. They're weird. They're different. They're, they're not what we humans would intuit about religion. As I've often said, we would create a founder and a book and a bunch of rules and put people under the rules and say, well done when they do the rules and say, keep it up, try harder when they don't. That's what religion does. But this truly is a gospel without law-based religion. This is a gospel not of rules, but of letting Christ Jesus rule. It is about letting the risen Christ rule in and through us in each and every moment because it's about Him. It's not about principles. It's about a person. And so we see the law actually gives sin an opportunity. Truth number five, the law is not sin, but it shows us our slavery to sin. Big difference. Paul was very clear in the passage we looked at last week. We are not law bashers. We are not law haters. We are not denigrating the law. The law is holy and perfect and good. 
but you put me under it and it's going to show me my slavery to sin and my need for salvation. Now, let me just, before we get any further, let me just say, if you're in Christ, you're not a slave to sin. If you're in Christ, you've died with Christ. You were buried and raised, and you're not a slave to sin. You may feel like you're a slave to sin sometimes, but the Bible says if you've died with Christ, you're not a slave to sin. So this is talking about how a Jewish person like Paul, whose former name was Saul of Tarsus, he was under the law, and the law showed him his slavery to sin. Well, truth number six, we finish with this one. Apart from the law, sin is dead. Now, that just makes sense after everything we've said, right? Under the law, sin is alive. Apart from the law, sin is dead. Well, that's not rocket science. You put me under the law, sin is excited. You free me from the law, sin is not thriving in my life. Nevertheless, people will fight tooth and nail to keep some part of the law in their lives. We do it in the Bible Belt of the United States of America. We do it better than anybody else, fighting for the law to be in the Christian life. Recently, someone wrote a response to some of the things I teach, and what shocked them the most was that I had the audacity to say that Christians should have no spiritual connection, no spiritual marriage, no spiritual relationship to the law. That was a shocker, really? Is that the shocker? When Jesus has already told us you're dead to the law, you're free from the law, you're not under the law, Christ is the end of the law for all those who believe. And so many, many in our culture today will say, well, sure, we can nod our heads at Romans 7, we've died to the law except for the Ten Commandments. And that's the holdback. That's the gimme. That's Linus with his blanket holding on to it for security. We want to hang on, hang on to the Ten Commandments because they give us a sense that, well, if we have these, we won't sin as much. If we look to these, these will keep us on the right road. They're like railroad tracks. Well, you're not a train. You're a child of God. You don't need railroad tracks. You need Jesus. And so when we look at people who are hanging on to the Ten Commandments as if those are the exception to what we're reading, we need to reread what we're reading. Because what we're reading is actually about coveting. And Paul was struggling with coveting of every kind. And the, the law, thou shalt not covet, comes from which part of the law? The Ten Commandments, doesn't it? So Paul is under, thou shalt not covet. The result is coveting of every kind. What Paul is saying we need to be free from is specifically the Ten Commandments. Now that's why this message is something to wrestle with. Are you going to hang on to tablets of stone for your victory over sin? Or will you cling to Jesus Christ within you and Him alone? When it says, apart from law, sin is dead, the paragraphs surrounding this statement involve coveting, involve tablets of stone, involve thou shalt not covet. So what are you going to do now? Every good Bible college, every good seminary, every good professor of anything Bible would tell you, we need to take it in context. And that's all we're doing today. We're taking it in context. And clearly, Paul has the moral law, the Ten Commandments, in view when he is telling you, trust Jesus instead. Because Jesus is enough. Well, I guess the big question among questions for this passage is, you know, this struggle in Romans 7, I mean, we've read it, some of you have read it 500 times since you were six years old, perhaps, verses from this passage were brought up in your church, in your home fellowship, in your private Bible study, whatever it might be. But Romans 7, I'm doing the very thing that I don't want to do. Wretched man that I am, I'm, I've got this struggle and I can't get rid of it. So the question for today and the question we asked last week was, is this a believer? Is Paul talking about his experience as a Christian and then if so, is this the normal Christian life? And then if so, then is there no victory this side of heaven? Because if Paul couldn't experience victory, 
then how would we ever experience victory? I mean, he's tried harder than anyone we know. And so this is why it's so important for us to ask this question. Now, let me say again at the outset, if we come out on the other side of this and you feel differently, you feel that Paul is talking about his Christian experience, what I would say to that is, that is A-OK. In other words, the point is still the point, and here it is. Under the law, as a lost person, sin will thrive. Under the law, as a saved person, guess what? Sin will thrive either way. So either way, in a practical sense, we end up in the right place. It's all about Jesus. Just trust Jesus. Got a coveting problem? Trust Jesus. Got a lying problem? Trust Jesus. Got a lust problem? Trust Jesus. Don't trust Moses. Trust Jesus. Jesus is enough. So either way, we end up back at the same point. But I think there's something to be gleaned here as we begin to ask, is this a saved Paul or a lost Paul? Because it will help us decide, is this sort of the normal Christian life or is there something different? So here we go with three questions in review. Question number one, the first half of Romans 7 talked about a commandment coming into Paul's life. Do you remember that? When the commandment came, I died, he said. So when did the commandment come into Paul's life? Remember, I said that this passage is much like when you tell a joke, hey, a guy walks into a bar, and you're telling it in present tense, but it's already happened. It's a story from the past, but you're telling it in the present tense. This is what we see here in Romans 7. And also, let me just say, I don't think that this is just Paul's story. I think this is Israel's story. I think that every Jewish person that lays eyes on this story can relate to it if they've ever tried hard enough. And so this isn't just Saul of Tarsus, but he is also saying, get in our line of thinking, get in our train of thought, and here's what happens. I fought the law and the law won. And every one of us, every one of us Jews who took it sincerely and tried eagerly, we fought the law and the law won. So when did the commandment come into Paul's life? Clearly, when he was this high, it came into his life. Not later after the Damascus Road, not later in the desert with Jesus being tutored by the risen Christ, but the commandment came into Paul's life when he was a Pharisee, when he was born in a tribe that required law, observance, and obedience. He was born into an environment of law, and there it was staring him in the face. So this is why I think Paul's uh, struggle was as a Jewish person before he met Jesus. Now, let me say also as a side note, I'm not saying that there isn't struggle for Christians. Of course, there is struggle for us. I'm just saying that the source of this struggle does not have to be. We have a choice here. We don't have to choose law. We don't have to go to Moses for answers. We don't have to put ourselves under rules and then watch sin thrive. We don't have to do that. We really have a free choice. There really is another answer. Romans 7 is not your destiny. There's a reason that Romans 8 exists. And it says there is therefore now, not then, but now, no condemnation for who? For those who have been rescued and those who are now in Christ Jesus. So when did this happen to Paul? He says, when we were in the flesh. Do you remember that from last week? When we were in the flesh, the sinful passions were aroused by the law. Well, are we in the flesh today? No. Romans 8 goes on to say, you're not in the flesh, you're in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. Who are you? You're a child of God with the Spirit of God dwelling in you. You are in the Spirit, not in the flesh. So when did the commandment come into Paul's life? When he was an unbeliever, a devout Jew, he met the law, and certainly the law beat him up pretty good. Question number two, a similar one. At what time did Paul think the commandment would result in life for him? Do you remember he said this last week? The commandment that I thought would result in life actually resulted in death for me. 
Who would think that? Would a Christian out in the desert being tutored by the resurrected Christ, designed to be an apostle, would he be pushing Jesus, saying, I think the commandment is going to help me, Lord. I think the commandment is going to give me life. These are Jewish thoughts. These are Israel thoughts. These are thoughts that any devout Jew would have since they were this high, that the law will be life to them. Question number three, when was Paul killed by the commandment? Well, of course, again, when he met it, the law killed him. The commandment came in and I died, he says. So the commandment came in when he was a youngster, a young Jew, and it killed him. At some point, he realized his death and I've got a problem. I've got a coveting problem. I've probably got other issues. I am a slave to sin. I am spiritually dead. Who will rescue me? Miserable man, wretched man, confused man. Everything is murky. Help me. Where's the help? And then you have to ask if he encountered this confusion and this amount of failure as a devout Jew, then which Paul was killed by the law? Does the new creation need to be killed? No, the new creation does not need to be killed. You are alive to God in Christ Jesus, right? So God is not trying to kill the new you. It would have been the old you that died. And so Paul is talking about his old self being recognizing the death of his old self and the law showed him his death. Why am I going into this? Again, maybe, maybe this is a rare view. Maybe this is not the popular view, although many have agreed over the centuries. But still, the more popular view is Romans 7 is a Christian. Romans 7 is the normal Christian life. Romans 7 is all you can expect. There's no way out of Romans 7 until heaven. And what I'm saying is, I don't buy it. I don't buy it. He who has died has been set free from sin. All right, well, we continue today in the second half of Romans 7. Here we are in verse 14. This is the verse I left you with. Do you remember Paul says some pretty ugly things about himself? We know that the law is spiritual, but I am of flesh sold in bondage to sin. Now, that should be enough to introduce which Paul he's talking about, shouldn't it? I mean, he just finished telling us in the previous chapter that we've been crucified with Christ, buried with Christ, raised to newness of life. The only way you get free from sin is through death. You die and are freed from sin. And now he's saying, I'm fleshly. The law is so amazing, but I'm so horrible. The law is so lofty and holy and perfect, but I'm pitiful and pathetic. I'm sold in bondage to sin. I'm a slave to sin. Now, who would that be? Would that be a Christian? No way. That is not a Christian. Romans 6 tells us different about every Christian. And so what we see here then is he's telling us his story before he met Jesus. And believe me, there's a beautiful end to the story, but we're not there. The beautiful end of the story is who will rescue me? And then there's a rescue. But right now, he's not rescued. This is a lost person trying to be a devout Jew. Verse 15, what I'm doing, I do not understand. Why don't you understand? Because I'm not practicing what I would like to do, but I'm doing the very thing I hate. What's he trying to do? Real simple. I'm trying to not covet. (laughs) I've got everything else licked. I mean, people find me blameless, according to the law. Paul said his, his buddies, his friends found him blameless according to the law. So he's just got one project, okay? He's got this external righteousness, this shell of success, and people see this and they think he's really doing awesome according to the law, but he goes home with himself every night, and he knows what's going on up here. And what's going on up here is I can't stop wanting other people's stuff. I've got a coveting problem. I'm addicted to looking over at the yard next door and seeing what's going on over there and craving what they have. So he has an internal struggle he can't get away from. And this would be true, I'm telling you, as every Jewish person reads this, 
Every Jewish person who's tried, they could certainly relate to this. I'm doing what I don't understand. I'm, I'm trying to practice, but I'm not practicing. I, I wish I could do better, but I end up doing stuff I hate. I need rescue. I need help. But if I do the very thing I do not want to do, I agree with the law, confessing that the law is good. Do you see what he's doing? What's in focus? What's in focus here? Is Jesus in focus? Moses is in focus. What's the goal here? Is the goal Jesus? No, the goal is Moses in this verse. I'm trying to keep up with Moses and I can't keep up. I agree that the Moses goal is good. I agree that what Moses has invited us to as Israelites, I agree that it's holy and good. I, I just, I can't get there. Do you see what he's saying? And so you and I, a side note, a practical takeaway, you and I will experience the same thing if Moses is our goal. The Holy Spirit is not helping you obey Moses. The Holy Spirit is working the fruit of the Spirit in us. The Holy Spirit's goal is not that we keep the law. We got people today, they say it all the time. They say, God's helping me. That's, that's West Texas. God's helping me keep the law, right? Do we need a translator up here? Or do you, you understood that, right? I mean, you're... You're native speakers of this. <laughs> God's going to help me keep the law. You know, the Bible never says God's going to help you keep the law. That is not God's goal. That is not God's method. The source is knowing Jesus Christ, and the goal is knowing Jesus Christ. And the byproduct is the fruit of the Spirit. Moses is not in it at all. That's why it says we're dead, dead, dead to the law. So I'm doing what I don't want to do, and I agree that Moses is good. I confess Moses, the law of Moses, the Old Testament law, it is holy and good. I just can't get there, he's saying. So now, no longer am I the one doing it, but sin which dwells in me. You say, well, how does this fit? Well, he's a slave of what? What is he a slave of? The slave of sin, isn't he? Every unbeliever is a slave of sin. Do you know, it, you know, it's interesting, the NIV for a while there, if they were going to title this section of Scripture, I don't know if it's still there in the revised version, but originally the, the section of Scripture here that we're looking at, they titled it. You know how they put in like a little title and subtitle, a, a heading? They had the conflict of two natures. Now, you won't see the word nature anywhere in this chapter. The word nature is not there. What you see is a man discovering that he is a slave to a parasite called sin. That's what you see. There is a principle, a power called sin, and he is a slave to it. And this Jewish man is figuring out, no matter how hard I try, no matter how much scripture I memorize, no, no matter how much I'm dedicated and committed, I can't get away from this power that is dominating me. So if we were to put a title on this based on the words, you could say the power of sin exposed, the power of sin revealed. Saul of Tarsus re realizes he's a slave. That's what's going on here. So now, no longer am I the one doing it. Not that that would matter. I wish it were me, but I, I've given it my best shot and I still can't do it. I, something else is dominating for I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh, for the willing is present in me, but the doing of the good is not. Can you say that of a devout Jew? Would, would a devout Jew turn to you and say, I want to do the right thing? Absolutely, the willing is present in me. You talk to any rabbi, you talk to Saul of Tarsus, his problem was not lack of trying. His problem was not lack of willpower. He had willpower. He just couldn't get it to work. For the first time, he realized my willpower is not the answer. There is something stronger than me that is taking over. My willpower doesn't work. So I know that nothing good dwells in me. I'm seeing this parasite in my flesh, in my body, working in the members of my body. I'm a slave to this thing. The willing is present. I want good. I want the law. I want Moses. I want the goal. But the doing, it doesn't happen. It, it just doesn't work out. For the good that I want, I do not do. But I practice the very evil that I do not want. 
Now, I know what some of you are thinking. Perhaps you grew up in a, a grace community. Perhaps you grew up with a teaching on identity in Christ and what it means to live under grace. And you've always thought that this passage is about a Christian. And that's fine. Again, that's fine if that's your opinion. But again, do you see sin didn't die when we got saved? Sin didn't die. It's still a force. It's still a power. We died to sin, but sin didn't die. So under the law, sin will be alive. Under grace, sin is dead. And so the principle, the truth holds for us still. Still the answer is, why obey a parasite? Still the answer is, why offer my body to sin? As a Christian, why offer my body to sin? Why not offer it to Christ living in me? So still the idea that there's a parasite lurking called sin and that it's a fallen world and that this power of sin can operate through me when I present myself to sin, sure, that can happen as a believer, absolutely. All I'm saying is in Romans 7, it certainly seems like this guy is actually sold in bondage to this power called sin, and that is not a Christian. For the good that I want, I do not do, but I practice the very evil that I do not want. But if I'm doing the very thing that I do not want, I'm no longer the one doing it, but sin, sin which dwells in me. He said it twice now, hasn't he? He has said it twice, that there is a parasite called sin and it is dominating him such that he, with all his fervor and all of his devout devotion, he can't make it happen for himself. I find then the principle that evil is present in me, the one who wants to do good. How do you define good here, though, in context? What has he called good? Just a few verses prior, he's called the law good. The law is the goal. The Jewish law, the Old Testament law is the goal. That's the good that I want to do and I can't do it. For I joyfully concur with the law of God in the inner man, but I see a different law in the members of my body waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin which is in my members. Are you a prisoner? As a Christian, you're not a prisoner. You've been set free. Does a Jewish person have an inside man? Does a Jewish person have an inner man and an outer man? Yeah, what do you call the outer man? You call it their body. What do you call the inner man? That would be their spirit soul area. If you were to ask a Jewish person, hey, inside of you, excuse me, Mr. Jew, inside of you, you know, your inner man, your inner self, inside of, not your body, I'm talking about inside, like your desires. Do you not want, to, do you not try, do you not seek within yourself to obey Moses? And they would say, yes, I do. I seek that in my inner man. I, just as David talked about his inner self, his spirit, his, his heart, his, he, he, he had a place within him that was not just physical. And so do Jewish people and so does everyone. But the bottom line is he couldn't pull it off. But I see a different law in the members of my body waging war against the law or the power or the principle of my mind, making me a prisoner of the law of sin or the power of sin or the principle of sin. Don't read into that. There's a reason there's a lowercase l there on the word law. And that's because it's not Moses. It's a principle, a power, or a parasite called sin. Wretched man that I am... Who will set me free? Notice it's who will set me free. So apparently this guy still needs what? He still needs to be set free. Have you been set free? The Bible says that you have been set free. But in this story, this person needs to be set free. The Bible says that you've been set, th set free through death with Jesus Christ. This person is still waiting to be set free. So this is Saul of Tarsus expressing his frustration, but it is also every devout Jewish person that has ever lived could read their story right into this chapter. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Apparently something's coming. There's hope. So then, on the one hand, I myself with my mind am serving the power or the principle of God. Again, this is not Moses. This is the power or the principle of who God is, all of God. But on the other hand, with my flesh, the law of sin. 
So it sounds like something is changing. There's a who will rescue me, and then there's a thank you for rescuing me, and now the dynamic of the struggle is starting to change. Apparently, he's starting to get on God's team, and then look what happens next week. We won't go there, but look at what, look at what opens next week, chapter 8 here. There is therefore when? Now. Now that what? Oh, now that I've been rescued. See, if Paul was a Christian and he was struggling, was there no condemnation for him then? Sure, there's no condemnation for any Christian. There's only condemnation for unbelievers, right? So he was struggling and struggling and struggling, and then he got rescue, and then it says there's therefore now, now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So what did we see today, and what's the big deal? Number one, the big deal is you're not sold in bondage to sin. That's a big deal. We really can say no. We're not, Romans 7 is not our resume. It doesn't have to be our future. Romans 7 is not our destiny. Number two, any devout Jew would say they want to obey the law, but they can't. And that's what we see here. Number three, this struggle under the law is what Paul experienced before his conversion on that Damascus road. But this struggle is also representative of Israel's experience, not just Paul's. Also, this struggle does not have to be the normal Christian life. Do you see that? That's, that's our takeaway. That's the big deal. Lord Jesus Christ, thank you for setting me free from sin. When I get the thoughts, I remember it's a parasite. When I get the thoughts, I remember it's not me. When I get the thoughts, I remember I once was sold in bondage to this, but now I'm not. I've been bought with a price by Jesus. I belong to him. I don't belong to this parasite. This struggle does not have to be the normal Christian life. I don't have to wake up with a rule book and then spend the entire day breaking the rule book. How many Christians feel like that's their experience? Christianity is a rule book and I, my job is to wake up and break them every day. I mean, that seems to be the normal Christian life for some. What I'm saying is it doesn't have to be. We're choosing the rule book instead of letting Christ rule. This will happen to anyone, saved or lost, who puts themselves under the law. You're grabbing for Moses, and the answer is Jesus. You're craving tablets of stone so that you can show off your dedication and your commitment and your consistency, and it's a trap. There's a new way, a better way, and he's the only way. But thanks be to God, He has set us free in Christ Jesus. And there is now no condemnation for us. Is that not beautiful? Amen. Let's pray together. Father, we thank You for a victory. Not that we have to drum up emotionally. We thank You for a victory. We don't have to feel it. We, we don't have to understand it. All we have to do is believe what you've said is true, that when sin comes knocking, it's not coming from within. When sin comes knocking, it's coming from the outside. When the thoughts come at us, the lustful thoughts, the gossipy thoughts, the critical thoughts, when the thoughts come at us, Father, we thank you that we can recognize we're not sold to those. We're not in bondage to those. We've been set free. You bought us. We belong to you, Father. We thank you for this simple truth. Romans 7 doesn't have to be our resume. Romans 7 doesn't have to be our destiny. Father, we thank you that there is a Romans 8. And that now, for us, all of us who are in Christ Jesus, not in the flesh, but in the Spirit with you, on your team, belonging in your family, Father, we thank you that we have been invited to the table of freedom. Not just freedom from the law, but freedom from sin's power. We thank you for this glorious freedom. Teach us, Father. We look to you and your grace because you really are enough for us. In Jesus' name we pray it. Amen.